Hey, everybody. Welcome to another epidition. Oh, epidition. Epidition. That sounds like we're having an epidemic. It's not. Um, anyway, an episode of Creatives Ignite, and it's good to have some new faces in the chat. I hope you guys have a good time. I'm here with my good friend, Von Glitschka, and maybe some of you guys have seen some of his work. I'm pretty sure my mom has seen lots of things that you've done. Not that she plays Dungeons and Dragons, but you did do the Dungeons <laughs> and Dragons logo and lots of other things. My One of my favorites is the Big Ass Fans logo. I just really, I love that one. That one's still just, maybe it's just because I get to say ass, but uh, that, that's a safe word here on, uh, we try to keep it G-rated. Um, <clears throat> oh, and Jeremy said he didn't know you did the Dandy logo. Yeah, you guys should you know. check check it out. Check out all the ones he's done. Big companies, small companies. That's one thing I love about Vaughn, um, that it's not um, – because I know that you did – worked with Brian White, and there was like a plumbing uh, company in Kansas. And I was like, really? He did that? And I was like – I mean, it was super- Chicago, actually. Chicago. Anyway, it was super cute. And I, But sometimes it's – we. I would think that maybe you just do these really big projects and it just made it so nice that to know that you do some small ones too, which is those really are cool. always the funnest ones to work on, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So today we're going to be talking about something that I, I hoped he had never dealt with, but we did talk about this a little bit. So it's about burnout and all the things that go with with that. And in over 20 years being in the business, I've been in the business 25. I think you've probably been in it over 25 as well. But I was just trying not to date you. But was that you have dealt with burnout and then I wanted to know how you avoid it now or how you deal with it now. So we, I have lots of questions, but just in case somebody doesn't know, can you um, just tell us a little bit about how um, about how you, uh, what kind of work you do and um, how, when you started running your own business? Well, I had been working for other people from about 19, this is going to date me, obviously, 1989 until uh, 2002 when I was an art director at a local agency, uh, caught my daughter's cold, came in on Tuesday, called in sick Monday. And they pretty much had my boxes packed and handed me a check. And uh, <laughs> it turns out that the my boss at the time was kind of paranoid and un, unknown to me, all the previous designers that work there were now working for his competitor across town. And they had approached me two weeks prior to that and asked me if I'd be interested in working there. I'd already turned it down, but he found an email in my deleted email and he freaked out and just preemptively fired me. So uh, that's kind of how I got started is um, uh, I lost my job and it was my wife that said, well, you've wanted to start your own thing. Why don't you just do it? And so I did and um, it's worked out pretty good. It's a real, anybody that runs their own business knows it's a roller coaster. So the, uh, yeah, that's always, that's the hardest part. But other than that, that's when I started 2002 and, uh, pretty much started local and then started expanding from there, taking out source book pages to get in front of agencies and other design firms. And did you have an uh, agent when you were doing that, when you were taking out source book? So for I, somebody maybe like Jeremy Rivers, he might not know what source book, what it was, but there was like a book of a whole bunch of illustrators. Yeah. There, right. There's there's still around. There's workbook. I, I don't know if all of them are around still because back then the, you had this um, the illustration annual. You had workbook. You had black book. You yep. had like two or three other ones. Uh, some of them have gone under since, and they used to be pretty large and about five inches thick. Now they're about maybe an inch and a half thick and smaller, and um, if you just do good promotions on social media, you're going to get in front of more people than those do. It used to be the way to do it. And I did it for eight years. Um, and then uh, back in 2008, when the economy tanked, 
I didn't want to spend $2,500 for a page, so I decided to skip it. And then not knowing if it would drastically affect, you know, getting in front of people who can hire you. And then it didn't. So I never really did it again. And since then, obviously, social media has changed the, the game. Um, so that that's where I started 2002. So is how long I've been running my own my own business. So there definitely are ups and downs with that. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I started my uh, my design course. It was in December. So, hey, happy. Uh, what? How many years is it then? If it, 2002. So this is 20 years, right? Right. It's 2022. Yes, do math. Yeah, I know. I know. Years. We're not math people. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, I'm pretty sure I was about to say 25, but it's definitely not 25. So we both have a 20 year anniversary. When was your anniversary? What, what, when, what month did you start your business? Um, February 2nd, 2020. Oh, nice. Mine was December. You got me way beat but there, but, um, but it, it, that's a big, um, uh, it's a, that's a big number to be working for yourself because you know, I mean, that's at least multiple times that the economy's gone up and down. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so many um, new things have come in. So how we used to advertise like in source book or in with communication arts or in, in something where you had um, you were just putting in work to try to get seen in a illustration annual or design annual. And then, um, now you are, I don't know how you have, so, I mean, I don't know how you are able to be on social media and cause you're very, um, I don't know. My brain is, I should have taken my medicine at lunch. Anyway, you're very active and especially in some, some weeks, man, I see tons of things and you're helping other people or you're, um, sharing something that somebody did or you're, um, helping Adobe um, with helping them fix something or bringing something to their attention. <laughs> I don't um, know about fixing it. I've been telling them something for a decade and they still haven't fixed it. So yeah. well, they just hadn't gotten around to it, I guess, but I I'm going to say you're helping them because there are many things that, and, and you also do lots of things. So how many different, um, I call them buckets, but how many different buckets do you have where you're getting um, in regards to like income streams? Because I I don't know how you're able to do everything you're able to do, but I think maybe that's um, how you don't have burnout. I, I try to do a lot of different things, but try to progressively push forward on each one whenever I have time. So I'm bouncing around to a lot of things I have going and I always know when like a specific deadline is or what I want to get done by a certain date. And then I figure out how much I need to get done on that every day. And that way it makes it more manageable. Um, I, I remember when, when I got married, there's stuff I learned about myself that I never realized about myself that my wife would clue me in on. I'm like, she, she would get irritated when we eat dinner because I would like focus on one thing. I never knew I did this until she pointed out where, why do you eat like that? And I go, what are you talking about? And she goes, well, like, like your beans, you ate all the beans then you're done with that. You went over here and you ate all that. Then when you're done there, you went over here and ate all that. And I go, I didn't know that was a problem. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's like, it's funny because there's, until you work for yourself and you run your own business, you don't notice things about yourself because you're never really focusing on that. That was somebody else's responsibility if you work for them. And so now it's like I, I've there's a lot of things that I learned about how I best process information, um, how I like to organize stuff. And you don't always have that luxury when you work with other people because they have an established system. This is how we do this. This is how we do that. And so I've just, I think it's really important to find, uh, kind of figure out how best you learn. I learn best not by um, reading a book, even though I've wrote a book and people have read it and like it, that's not the way I learned the best. I learned the best by seeing somebody else do something and observe how they do it. And then I ask questions and then 
I like figuring it out on my own and figuring out how best it works for me to do it that way. And then, and then I just break, break it up into manageable pieces and just make sure I'm doing at least a little bit every day until I get it done. So it looks like a lot of work, but um, I use to-do lists quite a, quite a bit. And I try to do that every like every evening. So when I come in in the morning, I don't have to think, what am I doing? I just look at it, jump on it, go to the next thing, jump on it. Now, of course, clients come back to me like this morning and said, hey, that business card you designed for us that we didn't do anything with, we want to move forward on it now. And so I'll have to jump on stuff like that, but then I get back on my schedule. So so you um, must create some time in in your day for those like buffer zones or the it's not like your schedule is so tight that you can't do some well, yeah. of that. well that's part of the schedule is I work into it stuff that isn't client driven it's stuff that I just want to do um I I figured out pretty early on that you know I would see certain type of work being done back in the day I remember when linear line became pretty popular and a friend of mine, Felix Sockwell, was doing a lot of linear illustration. I go, God, that looks fun. So I just made it a habit for a whole year that anytime I was just going to doodle on my own, I was just going to practice that linear line style and just see if I could work stuff out. And the more I did it, the more I enjoyed it. And then I was able to take that and then start doing design and illustration with it just to get it out there. And sure enough, art directors started hiring me to do that. And that was a pretty popular, it's not super popular now, but for about a decade it was. And so I try to do that. If I see certain trends or styles, then, you know, I always want to try it out just for no other reason to see if it's something that might lead somewhere. Well, and I know, like I have the, um, those big ones, purple ones, green and ones. I can't remember what color the other one is, but it's like for the textures and stuff. It's like, I oh, mean, yeah. it, it's an old book. These no. are three awesome books and I love these books, but it, t- it talks about. Well, you I can tell it. you how those came about. That wasn't like, I didn't plan on any of that. That was um, before social. There is a how design forum and one of their um, editors for how publishing, how books had posted on the forum saying, hey, do you have any book ideas? Well, I key, I, I, I'm also a list maker. I, I, I use my iPhone now basically to do it, but you can pull up. I have thousands of words that I keep categorized and alphabetized just based off of words I've never heard or I thought the meaning was cool, but um, I'd never heard it before. And so I'll look up words. I'll add words to that. Um, I have this whole narrative and story in my head I've been working on for years. And anytime I think of a conversation, it'd be a good little thing. I write it up and put it in that notes. And in regards to, um, you know, how you can do, you you can do that in any respect. So I'm always writing down ideas. Like I want to explore this sometime and see where it goes, you know? Um, I, I think, there's an interesting, and I, I've, I've written notes for myself. I haven't published anything on it, but I've always thought it would be interesting to do something based off of, you, you, hear, you, you hear the term um, cultural appropriation a lot, mm. especially in context of art. Like um, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest with Native American tribes all around me. I love the Pacific Northwest style art. If you could classify an ancient form of art and say it was some of the first graphic design, it'd be Native American art. It's very graphic, very flat, uh, based off of shapes. It doesn't have gradation to it, has negative space. It's it's pretty cool. Well, I remember a Native American artist came to our illustration class at Seattle Art Institute and taught us how to do form line illustration, explain the meaning behind the shapes and why you combine one shape with another shape to create the eyes. I think they call them ovoids or something like that. And so I just dis- decided to do a DVG lab on that. And then um, I had several people that came back and said, well, aren't you appropriating that culture? And I go, and so I tried to make the argument. I go, art is culture art 
art historically has always appropriated culture. And one of the coolest examples I saw that was I was over in Jordan in 2008 and we went to Petra and the treasury building that you can, uh, that you saw in like Rares the Lost Ark. Well, that facade is carved out of the sandstone and it has elements of Greek, Roman, Egyptian, and um, Phoenician. I can't remember the other. There's like four different cultures in the styling that these Bedouins who were nomadic and traveled all around uh, those areas over there and then went back to um, where Petra is located. And then, which, which is amazing if you think about it, they had to have either really somebody sketching those so they mm -hmm. remember it or they had somebody had an eidetic memory and could recall it and then they carve it in the stone and they take all these references from culture and create this treasury building which is like an amalgamation of all these different things so i get into stuff like that where it does it really have anything to do with doing modern design well i think in the sense of what inspires us and how it can influence us i so I, I like kind of figuring stuff out like that on my own. I love that you do that. But stuff, even those books, to me, they're still relevant. I keep them at home. I do have some books here, but those are ones that I will reference because you're using your photography to take pictures of textures or I look at the floor a different way because of that. Cause I'm like, Ooh, I could use this. It yeah. That goes back to art school. That was a photography assignment. And so I, I jumped over a no trespassing fence to go into an abandoned hotel and started taking textures pictures. And that's when I first started, but I didn't really start doing it like how I do it now until digital came on the scene and you could take a good quality, you know, pixel based kind of image. Yeah. But um, before social media, as I, I think I kind of got a little off track, the the editor for How Books said, hey, do you have any ideas? And so I brought up this list of book ideas I'd just been making. And I posted three of them. And she goes, hey, we like that texture one. Can you do that? And that's how that started. And then they asked me to do another one. And I just kind of started doing these things that I do on the side already such as patterns and ornaments and all that. And I still got a whole closet of, of boxes of books that, <laughs> that no, we, so if anybody wants one, just uh, hit me up and I'll sell it to you for cost. Yeah. Hey, that's pretty good. Well, uh, it'll, uh, we'll have all that stuff, your website stuff. I'll go ahead and put it in the chat. So um, again, if you're listening later or you're listening on wherever you get your podcast, it's one of the first links at the top. And then if it's, if you're watching on YouTube, there's a link down below. So, okay. So then in these years, 20 years of running your business, when was the first time you experienced burnout? And can you explain that situation? Um, it's nothing I've ever avoided. So um, it still happens. Um, I don't remember the first time. I, I It was definitely probably the first year, though, because I, I had no... Uh, shortly before I lost my job is when the, um, the dot-com bomb happened. And overnight, literally at that point, I, before that happened, I was doing all these editorial illustrations for publications, uh, tech publications um, that were all the, the rage at the time. And then overnight, like literally 12 of these magazines that would hire me to do spot illustrations like went out of business. And so uh, I didn't really have a freelance account with a bunch of different people when I lost my job. So it was, uh, that's where I started local. Um, unfortunately, a friend of mine just passed away. We went to his funeral on Monday. He was the first client I had as a freelancer uh, on my own. And he ran a ca local cafe and he's the one that plugged me into a local small business management group where I got to know the guy who directed it. He used to be a VP of Gallo Wine and Coca-Cola. And he kind of took me under his wing and mentored me and basically taught me 
okay, I understand what you do now. This is what you need to do to get your business side in order. And um, I, if I didn't have that, it would have been a lot harder to kind of get going. But the way I, I was doing anything and everything to stay, to bring work in and keep the cash flow going. And then obviously when you work like that, you're going to get burnt out. And when I get burnt out, uh, for the longest time, I wasn't sure how to resolve it. Over time, I figured out the best thing that works for me when that happens, because you can't really avoid it. Eventually, you're going to get burnout. out, is um, I have to basically set aside my normal creative work and just focus on something that I enjoy or I like, but has nothing to do with what my day-to-day -day creative job is. So for me, that's things like um, working on our koi pond in our backyard or cleaning it or, you know, uh, that type of thing. Um, since last year, going on, you know, walks and just listening to audiobooks is something I really enjoy. Always enjoyed audiobooks, but um, the, the walking part, just I'll just turn off my audiobook at times because my mind wants to start exploring things and mm. thinking of things and um, I've been known to kind of get in conversations with myself where I'm acting through like some dialogue between two characters in my head. And it sounds kind of like, wow, Vaughn, are you schizophrenic? No, that's just how I entertain myself. So, yeah. I talk to myself too, out loud in public. So it's okay. You're with, <laughs> you're with people who understand, I think. So. <laughs> Andre has a question. Andre is in Portugal and he's an illustrator and he does a lot cool. of stuff with um, history. His, uh, I would say Andre's um, anyway, um, graphic novels and teaches kind of about history. And his dad right. is, was a professor of history or is a professor of history. Andre says, how is it to work with your daughter? And did having her work, having her work with you help prevent, does having her work with you help prevent burnout? Uh, yeah, it does. Um, this year, not so much because she's kind of been out of commission for a year with tendonitis. But when Savannah started working for me, um, I would have friends I could run stuff by over the years. And, hey, look at this. Tell me what's wrong. And I valued their opinion enough that um, if they came back and said, yeah, I don't like this, I'd change that, then I'd, I'd, I'd do that. Well, Savannah came in and um, you know, I expected I was going to have to art direct some of this stuff when she's working on it. But what I didn't expect is her uh, kind of art directing me at times. And she did. And at first it kind of irritated me. I'm going, what are you talking about? You're a noob. You don't know what you're talking about. Only to find out she had a pretty good eye for understanding why something wasn't working, which I guess shouldn't uh, surprise me. She used to come in and draw in my office when I was working. And she said she'd sit by me literally and just watch what I was doing on screen. And one time I was working on an illustration. I zoomed in, grabbed some, moved it over, nudged it over a little bit with the nudge keys. And she's like, what'd you do that for? And I explained to her what I call visual tension. Well, it was too close to the other item, so your eye was going right to it. And unless you want that purposefully, you don't want that. So you want to give it some space. And she's like, oh. Then a couple of weeks later, she's sitting by me. I'm working on something different. And she's watching me, and she goes, you have visual tension. She points at the screen. <laughs> and I'm like, what? And I'm like, oh, crap, you're right. So um, that was new when she started working with me is, um, but we work, we work good together. We work good together when we brainstorm and come up with ideas. So we're working on, she is helping me with some characters right now. And so we put together a list of um, gorilla characters, basically, for this company that whose name plays off of a gorilla. And we're working those out, but coming up with clever, kind of almost meme type of themes. And I wasn't completely sure if the client was going to be on board with that, only to find out Savannah knows her memes, man. She's uh, she's more than I ever have. She's had like, 
I would say it's a fluke other than the fact she's done it like 12 or 13 times where she'll get like 200,000 likes on something. And it's, I don't, I still don't get it because I'm going, why? I don't understand this. You, you had a little doll wig fall on this other doll and you posted it and you have 150,000 likes. I, I don't get it. You know? <laughs> So but, I go, okay, you, you have to monetize that, Savannah. You have to figure out a way to monetize that. And she goes, that's not the point. And I go, well, no, that actually is the point. You want it to? <laughs> that would be awesome. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so um, when you're working with Savannah, or when y'all are brainstorming, because she can still brainstorm because the tendonitis luckily doesn't affect her yes. brain. I'm sure she's busting ready to get back to the And art directly. So. <laughs> oh, I'm yeah. sure. Um, but, uh, it's funny that you say that because, um, Bethany Heck was my professor, Ross Heck's daughter. And so, but, and you know, he, she grew up with somebody who was really into typography and that makes sense that Bethany's into typography because same thing with Savannah, she was around it all the time she could see. And because you were willing to explain to her what wasn't working and she was willing to ask, right. You weren't just pushing her off, then she was learning at a pretty young age. So then she could see things and she was anyway, I no wonder she has a good eye because she's been trained in it for a long time. Yeah. She's a, she's a better natural drawer than, than I am. Um, and I take credit for that because I forced her to draw at a very young, <laughs> young age and told her to stick with it. Well, I'm glad you did. Cause she is really, really uh, super, talented she's funny y'all are both funny together and but anyway so going back to you and her and brainstorming when when you are burned out or when she's burned out um do you have side projects that y'all work on together or is that usually like you're working on something and she's working on something do you ever kind of do something as a unit we we've done that a few times um there was one idea that i thought um we should we should do a, a licensed product idea together. And I wanted it in her distinct style because she likes to um, describe herself as the queen of cute. So I said, I want these cutesy, but I want to create these princess butterfly female characters. And so uh, we called it Flutter Girls. I did the branding for it. She did the illustration. And it came out really good. And so it's like, if you go to our site and download the characters, you can see samples of that in there. Um, so we've done stuff like that. Um, when it comes to personal projects, um, she has her own set of her own agenda for that type of stuff. Uh, because she's been dealing with tendonitis, she's, um, she's found another niche she really enjoys. And she's actually making a revenue stream off of a Twitch channel and it's and I showed a little bit of that in, um, I think I showed it in my talk at Creative South. I can't remember one I of my talks. It. I showed it where she came up with a persona based off of a, of all things a s'more, but it's a female character. But she's actually a personified s'more. I know it sounds weird, but it looks cute anyway. I'm sure. Um, she's worked out a, a VTube animation for it. And so she streams and she reviews like uh, doll collection stuff and, you know, people she'll, she'll stream for a couple hours and then she'll text me, guess how much money I made off the of stream. And I go, I don't know how much $800. And I'm like, what, for what did they buy <laughs> stuff? No, that's just donations. And I go, why? Why would they donate? You know, I just, I just, I still don't get it. I, somebody has yet to explain the rational rationality behind that, but you know, she does it. She enjoys it. So more power to her. I know. And Andre says uh, that Twitch is hard. So that really is um, amazing that she's able, but somebody's seeing, it's just like if um, they see value in what she's doing and luckily she's not having to use her arm while she's doing it. She's using her brain and her verbal, yeah. you know? Okay. So then how, 
when you go through burnout as you've been before, when there's that pressure that you still have to keep working, this is this is what happens to me at least. I can't just stop and not yeah. do anything. But one of the things that um, I've tried to do from this summer, uh, I did was I have put in some buffer time of that rest or of something else that's using my creativity in another way. I didn't really, I realized I wasn't burned out from being creative, but I just didn't, uh, it was burned out the, the avenue, the path I was always walking, or maybe it was the level of it. But how have you maybe not avoided it or, but how have you redirected it since it's not something you can totally avoid? Yeah. And, and, I, I brought up the koi pond. That'd be one example, but I can't, like you said, I don't have the luxury at times to spend, you know, the whole day doing something else. So even if it's a half an hour or um, one thing I learned years ago, I went to see Sam Harrison speak at the How conference and he had wrote a book called um, Zing. And so I was so impressed with his talk about just, how to work through stuff like this that I went and bought that book, Zing, um, read it. And it's something you could read like in literally 45 minutes because each page is just a simple quip that makes you think. And um, I read that. And one of the things in the book was about how best do you think or something like that. And it said, you might be the type Mm. of person that does their best thinking outside the context or environment that you actually create in. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So ever since then, if I have to like, just do ideation, um, I try not to do it in my studio. I'll get my car. I'll actually drive about a mile away to, of all places, a grocery store parking lot. And I park there and that's where I do my ideation and stuff. Um, It also there's a lot of crazy stuff that goes down the parking lot that you just never notice until you know, you <laughs> tell you notice there's that. But um, I, I found that I can do ideation um, outside of my studio better than I can do inside my studio. So I work out problems and ideas there. Then I go back and then I can cherry pick which way to go. Um, ironically, another place, and this used to kind of irritate my wife because she thought I wasn't paying attention when I did it, but, um, that's my husband. He doesn't think I'm, he's like, could you just watch the TV show with me? And I'm like, I I am watching it. (laughs) Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. And there's actually been studies done on, you actually pay better attention when certain people, not everybody, but for me, I know it's this way. I pay better attention if I, if I'm just standing there, like listening to like, let's say a pastor on Sunday morning or whatever, my mind will start to like wander. And then pretty soon I'm thinking something else. Well, if I'm sketching and I'm not really trying to do a full blown illustration, but like doodling or stuff, I'm paying attention, but my mind stays engaged on the topic, even though it looks like I'm not paying attention. And I used to get, um, when I worked at Upper Deck, I do the same thing in our, our creative meetings. And then I get my creative review and the, the VP would say, hey, I noticed you don't pay attention You're in our creative meetings. I go, I'm paying attention. Well, you're always sitting there drawn. I go, that's how I pay attention. And I go, do I never, do I not participate in conference? Well, yeah, you bring up good points. Well, that's how I just don't get don't think I'm not paying attention. That's just how I pay attention. But I didn't even have the research to back that up until later when I started reading up on a, on a few things. And you learn stuff about cognitive thinking and how it works and how drawing engages like all four modalities at the same time, uh, which is why it's a supercharger for brainstorming and solving problems and coming up with ideas. Yeah. Okay. So then um, so doing sketches and not in your studio, a parking lot in your car. Yeah. Okay. So you're not like sitting outside. I mean, in Portland no. or in Salem, it's kind of no. rainy sometimes. So. I'll, I'll have, I'll have music on, but it has to be music. That's non-lyrical, like classic or something. Right. Right. So in, um, just going out, getting outside of, um, 
out of what your normal thing is. You're also, I just from what you said earlier, is you're not buck, bumping stuff up right so tight. So there is a little bit of flexibility in your time in your day. But yeah. what about? Um, do you take like a certain like? Do you work on Saturdays and Sundays? Do you take a certain day off, or do you? Um, f- for the longest time, I I I got in the bad habit of you know, doing work over the weekend. And um, now I try to focus on specific personal projects on on the weekend, if I'm going to do anything. Uh, Lately, it's been every weekend, I want to get at least one new uh, People of Process movie recorded and, uh, you know, get it set up so it's ready to auto update on YouTube. So that's what I've been doing lately. But um, with Savannah being out this year, I've had to work a couple weekends just to make sure I don't get behind on certain things. But for the most part, I think I try to, it changed all for me a lot last year. And it's when I started, um, uh, you know, made a decision uh, to start walking um, our, this being a graphic designer isn't a physically demanding job. So um, I got in some pretty um, sloppy bad habits. So I started exercising. And um, so over the last year, I've lost a little over 60 pounds. And I really love walking now because it's a time where I can uh, dive into thinking and problem solving or just enjoying an audiobook. And not trying to, I, I always, I, I guess for me, I get in the habit at times where if I'm not doing something creative, I, f- I figure like I'm, it's like wasting time. Mm-hmm. It's like, so yeah, I, I'd rather work on something at least personal creativity wise than waste time watching TV, for example. Mm. Um, so if I'm watching TV, I like have my iPad right next to my machine like right down. Right. Right. Can't, it's reverse on there, <laughs> but it's right, right next to my workstation. I'll usually have whatever series I'm watching going there, but I'm kind of not fully watching it, just more of listening to it. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, I try to, I try to distinctly limit how much time I'm spending doing actual work. I've forced myself to, definitely cut it off at a certain time, uh, not stay up as late as I used to get more sleep, get better quality sleep, I should say, um, you know, drinking lots of water. That's, that might sound weird, but no, our, our, our brains are made up of like 80% water. Maybe it's our bodies, but I did a study, not a official study, but with my students, I was like, okay, I'm going to ask them a couple of things because I, I, listen to hidden brain or something they were talking about water and the impacts or they talked about just looking at at trees and being outside seeing more things you know and they um i wanted to see if students who actually got outside were making better grades or students who drank more water were making better grades and it actually both of those things were those kids who actually got outside even if they were smoking but they went outside and they saw trees. They actually ended up and drinking more water. They weren't always the same kid, but, um, but those tended to be better than the people who were staying up late and trying to get, you know, like the stress just kind of hung on them instead of them taking time to breathe and time to do that. And, um, and I thought that was just fascinating. Granted, it was just me with 20 kids, but. Yeah. Nothing. I mean, some of my favorite times growing up was when we went camping and we we're out in the middle of nowhere. We used to go to a place in Eastern Washington called Salmon Lasac, which is uh, kind of a weird name now that I think about it, but, <laughs> but it's a really cool campground, you know, it's the kind of campground that had bears that would walk around at night. So, you know, that always freaked me out a little bit, but uh, just being outside in general, going to the coast here in Oregon, you know, all those things are, you you have to get outside. You can't be locked up behind a computer all day long. It's not healthy. 
but I guess I always thought that I was wasting time if I wasn't working or, but really yeah. I realized that this summer that I ended up, I was, I was more focused and I could actually get more done in a shorter amount of time if I would take those breaks, if I would do something else. And I feel like you have to learn it yourself. Uh, somebody can tell you, but um, until you actually try it, uh, or at least that is how it was for me. Maybe I'm just hard headed. But what do you think the difference is between burnout and creative block? Do you burnout, experience creative block? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's much like writer's block. You mm -hmm. know, um, although I think the the hardest part of writing is allowing yourself to just let it come out, and not worry about how structured it is and then mm. perfecting it in editing. Writing is all about editing, I've come to understand. Um, so I think for me, creative block is if I'm really, and this is goes back to a talk I did where I, I was trying to, it wasn't the intent of the talk, but I was just wanting to show um, why, well, here's the question I'll pose. Why is it hard at times to come up with um, clever, unique, eureka moment ideas. It's because it's unsustainable. Um, that mm. kind of idea, think ideation and thinking happens at what's called the gamma level, uh, which isn't normal consciousness. It's a higher form of consciousness, higher form of thinking brainwave pattern wise. And so it's why things like brainstorming work so well, because you have multiple people trying to peak and get to that level of gamma level thinking where an idea can form. And it could be a stupid idea, but because they popped into that, that stupid idea could inspire somebody else. Oh, you could take, they, that makes them think of something that they didn't think of. They pop mm. into that level. And um, this was all part of a, a study that, that I read and it talked about, it categorized, you know, the brainwave activities and, what each one is for normal consciousness. Um, then you have your, your dream state. Then you have gamma. Um, nobody walks around gamma state all the time. That's why when you come up with ideas, they usually happen when you're kind of most relaxed and your brain is doing all the work in the background. And then you're in the shower or you're driving and, and an idea hits you. And then you just have to remember to write it down. There's so many times I've been out walking or driving and I have this dialogue of two characters that would be hilarious that I want to write down, but I can't record it or do anything. So I try to remember and then I get home and I can't remember what it was. It's like, so yeah, I, I think for me, the creative block, when it happens, that tells me, that's a telltale sign that you're close to having a breakthrough moment. You just have to keep struggling with that pain. Even if you feel like you're hitting a wall nothing's happening, mm. then the best thing to do I found is just set it aside and just realize your brain's still dealing with trying to mm. make some connections and it never fails. It's usually not too long after that, your idea will just pop or an idea will pop into your head. So that's usually what I do is I push as far as I can go and then I set it aside and then once those ideas start popping, that's when I'll go back to it and start like drawing out stuff or uh, capturing it in a thumbnail drawing just so I don't lose the idea. I love that. So you're giving yourself permission to stop thinking about it, stop working on it, go work on something else. And then even in something else, you might have these explosions of ideas maybe for something else and or for this and you come back do you ever use voice recorder um i have but i always forget it's there so yeah <laughs> okay well i was just when you were on your walk and i know uh you're you're i know some books because we've talked about some of these before but are you listening to fiction or non-fiction when you're on these or is it a smattering of everything uh Pretty much anything and everything. I'm listening to a, oh, I can't remember the author's name. Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I can't remember the oh, author. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember. Really, it's kind of wigging my mind the way he thinks about finances because I'm no genius when it comes to finances, but uh, trying to wrap my head around 
the things he's talking about in in his latest book that I, well latest five years old I think uh, that I'm reading um, I love historical nonfiction um, I've learned more about history in the last decade than I ever did in school you know uh, reading like I don't know autobiography on Einstein was a fun one I did um, here here's a fact from that um, he got to a point where he realized him and his wife weren't getting along. And so he asked her for a divorce, but said, if you grant me a divorce, I'm eventually going to win the Nobel prize. And if you give me a divorce, I'll give you my prize money. And she agreed. And is like two or three years later, he won the Nobel prize, gave the money to her, which at the time was a lot of money, 250,000. Yeah. Uh, she turned around and bought an apartment complex and then rented him in an apartment. You know, I thought that was a little, little unique. So I, I like history just because you learn stuff. Uh, I read a book on John Adams last year that was awesome. Um, learned more about history from the American perspective from uh, David McAuliffe is a great Yeah, yeah. Author. My dad, yeah, he has all his books. He's my you would have fun talking to my dad. He loves yeah, we to read should them. we should not have won uh the independence war. I mean, it's amazing that we actually won that. And uh, but my favorite book from last year was um oh the pioneers, and it was about the colonies moving uh west. Mm-hmm. And going up in the Ohio area valley and uh, staking uh, homesteads and just expanding west. Uh, the part about the book that was kind of I'd never heard about before was these pioneers are talking to local tribes up in the Ohio area. And while they had moved out, they went out in the wilderness, found homesteads. But why they were doing that, they discovered all these mounds and ruins of some pre-existing culture and they go back to the city and they approach the Indian chief and is going, Hey, we saw these mounds out there. Did you guys do that? And he said, no, those were here before we got here. And, and then it had a little footnote and it said, hope well culture. And so that sent me off on a whole rabbit trail. And I looked it up come to find out Starting over, if you go to the top of America on the border of Canada and you go all the way to the left where Washington State is, in that top area of states going all the way over, all the way over to the Ohio Valley uh, territory, um, there's these mound cultures that were all part of the Hopewell culture and it pre-existed Native Americans, but they don't really know what happened to them. It's also down in the Mississippi Valley. Area. Yeah, we have some in Alabama. Yeah. yeah. And and I was just going, what? I never heard about any of this. And it's like, I found that fascinating. It's like, so that that's why I like reading is because stuff like that, you're not going to hear in a generalized history class. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I love stuff like that too. That's awesome. So does reading stuff like that spark something for... um either a one-off drawing or a side yeah. project or something. Oh yeah. All the time. That's why I came up with the DVG lab series. Cause I would think of something. I go, well, that's cool. I go look at it, read more up on it. And um, I saw an image one time from an archeological dig. I follow archeology span on Instagram, a couple accounts, and they're showing something from Egypt. And one of them was a freeze painting of Nefertari. And I go, God, what's that crazy hat she's wearing on that? And so I go look it up and it almost looks like she has a turkey sitting on her head. And I just thought that was fascinating. I go, well, that'd be kind of fun to like simplify and uh, create a graphic of it. And so uh, when I did Modern Culture in 2021, I did a little graphic and I liked it so much. I I did it again, and that's up on my People of Process uh, YouTube channel. You can watch it. But that's a good example of just taking something that I found curious and kind of exploring where it goes. So do you have, and I know we're out of time, almost out of time. I have six minutes. Um, do you have time each week for like People of Process or or doing some of those things? Like, do you, do you, is that, 
a sacred time that you're not having client stuff come in on or, I mean, do you hold that pretty? Um, yeah, I always know the next one I want to work on. So if I need, if I have an hour to kill, I can jump on it and just keep moving it a little bit forward. Um, last, uh, back in s- September or something, um, is usually when we're contacted by LinkedIn and they say, Hey, what kind of courses do you want to do? And I'd, I, I've already been taking older content I did for LinkedIn originally since they decided to end DVG lab and put up people of, um, I'm moving stuff over cherry picking the ones I like the most. And then, uh, but coming up with ideas. And so now as I move forward, I'm going to try to, um, kind of hit both cycles. There's certain people that love using LinkedIn learning, but there's other people that just would never want to pay a subscription. So I'm trying to kind of serve both now. And so I'm trying to repurpose content, but spin it a little differently. So um, I don't, LinkedIn's going to keep making their money. It's not going to cut into their profitability at all, but um there are certain people who just, they're, they're never going to pay for a subscription. And so um, it's been cool because I get all kinds of emails now from people all around the world, from uh, the people love that I've been doing. And that's been, that's been a lot of fun. Yeah, that's cool. I shared the link in the, in the chat and I'll, it'll be underneath as well. So um, your YouTube channel your Instagram, your Twitter, and then your website as well. But you also have a new podcast that you started last year. Last year? Uh, Earlier, the beginning of this year. This year. It feels like it's last year. And it has a bad word in it. Um, But it's like (laughs) the poop show, (laughs) right? Um, The creative shit show. Yeah, right, right. That's right. So, so in in this you're talking with somebody who used to work with or was with Nina Papers and then there's two other people and i think there's two uh it's two women and two men right you, are you and yeah there's guy, right? Justin Aaron's he's creative director or creative strategist i forget what his title is don't email him you'll always get a out of town response from him we're always <laughs> joking around with him so Justin Aaron's, uh, there's Karen Larson. She's run her own agency for years. She works with uh, Jamie, who used to be the uh, marketing director for Nina Paper, and they work together. Um, now I can't remember what the name of their business is. Brand, um, I should probably know that, but I can't recall it off the top of my head, but they work together now. And uh, it's a lot of fun. I've known all of them for quite a long time. Yeah. So I'm going to put the link at least for the Apple podcast or yeah, probably is where this is anyway um, in the chat too. And it'll be underneath as well. So in that, how often are you meeting twice a month? Um, We usually meet at least once a month and we record a, a guest interview and then we record one where it's just us. So at the same time, you do both of them? Well, after one's done, then we end it, then we start and record the next one. So we just did that last week. So it'll be another week or two before we do another couple. Well, that's cool. So in doing that, what um, has that, because you always seem to be putting your um, time into some new things. And I, I do really like the podcast as well. So what... Because these are some of these people you've known for a long time. And so there's this, uh, you can tell there's a relationship. It's not like you guys are getting just to know each other, right? Yeah, yeah. There, there's. It, it's more like brothers and sisters working together because each of us feel comfortable enough with the other person that we can call them a, you know, we call them a, a I don't know, a, a, a dork and they're not going to get offended. You know, right, right, right. That kind of thing. So, but what made you want to um, be a part of this or start this? Well, it started by us just missing each other over the pandemic and doing Zoom calls and just cracking up and laughing and talking about stuff that, you know, I forget who it was. It might have been Karen who said, 
God, we should record this and do a podcast. And that's when we first started thinking about it. And um, it just kind of grew out of that. I love it. Okay. So it, that's not a ton of time, but it's in one day of a month, you guys are meeting and you're, you're doing these two. So it's, it feels like we see you doing lots of things, but really you're chunking your time really well. And you're. Yeah. Yeah. I, it all comes down to time management. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Especially running a business. So last question, um, because I just love the people of process. I, um, it, so why is process so important to you? Uh, well, there's going to be a movie going up soon. And the title of the movie is called Process Makes Perfect. So uh, you've always heard the term, you know, practice makes perfect. And that's true if your process you're already using is well-defined then yeah, practicing it is going to improve your results. But um, if you have a process that's flawed, then all it's going to do is reinforce the bad creative habits you might have. So um, I believe in kind of understanding yourself and figuring out how you work best. And that's different for each person. Mm -hmm. So I show practical things that help me and hopefully uh, those are things people can take and apply to their own process and figure out, wow, that's actually because everything I've learned, by the way, um, if you look at my creative brief I give to clients, that was derived from all the different agencies I've worked with over the years. And I'll, I see certain questions they ask. And I go, God, that's a great question. I'm pulling that out and I'm going to use that. Um, so I learn best by seeing how other people work in figuring out that makes sense. Uh, that's just smart. So um, I'm not doing that. I need to, I need to start doing that. So um, I like trying to help people just improve and enjoy what they're already doing and just get better at it. You've always been really good at sharing whatever people wanted to know. Qu any questions I said, hey, well, tell me if there's any, you don't want to answer. Not that we got to any, all of them, <laughs> but um, you always are like that when you've come to Mobile to speak, or when I've seen you speak at other places, people, you have this um, attitude of like, I want to help anybody. You can ask me pretty much anything I'm going to answer. And I think that a lot of people don't have that, but maybe it's from working alone. You knew that working with other people um, and seeing un behind the curtain for them helped you with your business and it doesn't hurt their business. So again, I love just your generous heart and that you're willing to do that for so many. So well, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to share all the ways that people can get in touch with you, which is right sure. here. I'm going to attempt to um, make sure that I spell everything. I know how to spell your last name. I've spelled it lots of times, but I always have to recheck, but I took these from the internet, so I should be good. But you can go to Glitchka Studios with an S on the end.com. It's all down below. You can, for y'all who are here live, you'd see it in the um in the chat. And then on YouTube, the people of process, uh, those are on your Glitchka Studios YouTube channel, right? Yes. Is there a people of yeah. process also? No, if they, I just have a domain that forwards to the okay. YouTube channel. Okay, perfect. I will add that in. And then, and the people of process, just so you know, is pplluv process.com. Yep. Okay. So I, at least I can read. And then if you are on Twitter a lot, um, and I'm on Twitter is my stream of conscious. It's not necessarily professional. It's just, you think of you work with people all these years and you something pops in your head and you say it to your coworker in the cubicle next to you. That's the way I treat Twitter. Well, I love it because it does feel like you're the voice of reason in lots of um, or the funny voice that's there saying what we all would like to say. But it's twitter.com slash Vonster, V-O-N-S-T-E-R. And then on Instagram, you can follow him at B glitchka so all these links are down below but von thank you so much for giving me time and thanks for talking about burnout and uh telling us that you go to uh uh parking lot at the grocery store <laughs> and that you uh 
do work in your koi pond and just going walking. I think that just even moving, I think that that's also helpful in our brain uh, oh, activity. Yeah. Um, I've seen that older people, when they stop moving, they their brains slow down. Just literally walking can help. I, your- I probably get that from my mom. She's in her 80s and she's like spends five hours outside doing yard work. I go, mom, hire somebody. And then I'm thinking, mm, maybe that's not bad that she's actually doing that. Yeah, I think probably it isn't. Yeah. I think it's probably good. All right. Well, guys, I will see you guys next week. And I just, Vaughn, thanks so much for your time and for sharing Thank your you. story. I appreciate it. Okay. I'll see y'all next week. Bye.